give us the example. One way, if your mind is super active at night and you're trying to fall asleep, you're trying to invest in your sleep and get more of it or get better quality, but then everybody notices that their mind is very active. What would be a way of addressing that through behavior instead of ruminating and thinking or even telling your mind, like, I just wish you would stop. Yeah. So when that is very hard to control the mind with the mind. And I think a simple rule that people can adopt is when your mind is not where you want it to be, look to your body, use the body to shift the mind. It's a simple equation. It's sometimes hard to do because thoughts can be so all encompassing. But when your mind is not where you want it to be, if you don't feel as happy or you're obsessing, you need to go to a mechanical system in the body because if you do that, you'll shift the chemicals that are released in your brain in a way that will allow you to regain control of the steering wheel. So there are a couple things that can do that immediately. Um, the most basic one and the simplest one is going to be with respiration, with breathing. So breathing and the neurons that control breathing are so interesting because they are constantly working. They work reflexively all the time. They're working right now. If you're alive and you're listening to this, you, they're working. But unlike a lot of aspects of our brain-body connection, we can grab a hold of it immediately and, and start tinkering with it. Like I can't say right now, hey, start digesting faster, Andrew, you know, or tell my intestines, hey, you know, slow down digestion, or I can't make my heart rate speed up just by telling it to, but I can slow down or speed up my breathing if I want to. So it lies at this bridge between the conscious and the unconscious mind. And I don't say this from any point or stance of philosophy. This is physiology. So if your mind is not where you want it to be, whether or not you're trying to sleep or work or focus or anything, I'm a big fan of this physiological sigh, which was discovered by physiologists in the 1930s. It's a double inhale through the nose and a long exhale that follows. The exhale can be done through the mouth or through the nose. If you're one of these people who can't breathe through your nose, you could do this all through your mouth. So it's just an inhale and then inhale again, even if you're just sneaking in a little bit more air, and then long exhale. The physiological sigh is known to physiologists and neuroscientists as a way to offload a lot of what's called carbon dioxide, and it immediately produces a, a heightened sense of calm or a reduced sense of stress and alertness. It's not gonna put you to sleep right away, but I'll just do it um, just by way of example so people can see since it always looks funny to breathe and you know, by example for some reason. And no, you don't have to close your eyes in order to breathe. Uh, you can breathe with your eyes open. So it's just. Right, so it's inhale, inhale, long exhale. This physiological sigh is known to reinflate these little sacs in the lungs called the alveoli of the lungs. And then when you exhale, it offloads a lot of carbon dioxide and that immediately reduces your levels of stress. Now, why am I recommending this? Well, if your mind is churning on something, maybe you're just obsessing, maybe you're not just, maybe you're not really stressed, maybe you're sad. But when you use respiration to kind of wedge in between your conscious and unconscious life, suddenly you realize that using something that's purely mechanical, your lungs, air, carbon dioxide, your mind shifts as well. And there are a lot of studies now, um, the best of which I think have been done by Jack Feldman, who's a professor at UCLA, who's worked his entire career basically on the physiology of breathing and the mind. The brain shifts, there are states of mind shift, the chemistry of the brain starts to shift. But this physiological side is more about grabbing a hold of the steering wheel again. That's what it's really about. And then it's about what you do next. So if you're having a hard time falling asleep, there are a couple things you can do. One is to do exhale emphasized breathing and not try to fall asleep. Just focus on doing big inhales and but even longer exhales. Doesn't matter if it's through the nose or the mouth. Exhales tend to long extended exhales tend to shift the body into more what we call parasympathetic states, more relaxed states. Parasympathetic is just fancy language for the system of the body that controls calmness. It promotes calmness. Think of it like a brake. Okay. There are two ways to slow down a car. One is to come off the accelerator. The other is to push on the brake. So long exhales are like pushing on the brake. Okay, now it's expected and it's totally normal that the brain will continue to ruminate if you're having trouble sleeping. After you've done that, and really what I just described probably takes about five to 30 seconds, I'm not talking about an extended breathwork protocol, just a physiological side to remind yourself, oh wait, I'm in control of this system that seems to be taking, kind of going off the rails on its own or that I can't seem to control. The extended exhales 
tend to bring more calm to the system. I'm a big fan of using a tool um, to shift the body into sleep or sleep-like states. Insomnia is terrible. People trying to sleep when they can't is absolutely maddening. Better to try and encourage the body to relax in, in general and see if you can fall asleep later, not try and force yourself into sleep. So uh, the two practices that work best for this is one goes by the yoga nidra. Many people have probably yeah, heard of it. it means yoga sleep. You just lie down, you listen to one of these scripts. They're available on YouTube as free, you know, totally cost free. Um, they tend to walk you through a, uh, a set of visualizations and a set of, of breathing protocols that essentially turn the mind off, right? This is the, uh, it, it essentially accomplishes what a couple stiff alcoholic drinks will do, which will also turn off your forebrain. The problem is it has other issues that go with it. And many people who use alcohol to try and calm down have a rebound increase in anxiety. So yoga nidra is a, is a wonderful practice. Um, the other thing that's wonderful and that now there's a lot of good data on is hypnosis. So one of the things I've become increasingly interested in is hypnosis because I have a collaborator um, by the name of uh, David Spiegel. He's an MD, MD, PhD. He's a, our associate chair of psychiatry at Stanford. And he's used hypnosis uh, to great effect for smoking cessation, pain management, breast cancer outcomes are greatly improved by the sorts of hypnosis he's done with his patients and for sleep and other things. And there's a wonderful resource that I'm happy to point people to. It's a free resource, uh, which is an app for Android and Apple called Reverie, R-E-V-E-R-I. You can go to reverie.com, download that. It's a hypnosis app where you can hear David's voice. He has a very hypnotic voice. Um, and he walks you through, you can pick a hypnosis for sleep or for pain management. They've even got some now to improve focus for work. 